Good morning. It's Monday, the 14th of September. Also this morning... In a special series, we'll be asking, could a robot take your job? That's Linda. That's a question we'll be trying to answer a little bit later. <laughs> uh, Carol will have the weather for us as well. Morning. First, our main story. The new Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has tried to reach out to all parts of his party as he announced who is to fill key posts in his shadow cabinet. One of his rivals for the leadership, Andy Burnham, is shadow Home Secretary, while his close ally, John McDonnell, becomes shadow Chancellor. Our political correspondent, Elliot Garnier, has more. Thank you. Well, Jeremy Corbyn said victory will also be a major talking point at the annual TUC conference, which is in Brighton today. Also on the agenda is how to respond to government plans to press ahead with its reform of trade unions, which would make strike action more difficult. To us about these proposed, proposed changes. Thank you. Back with you a little bit later. Thanks a lot. European Union ministers will gather in Brussels today for an emergency meeting on the migration crisis. Germany closed its border with Austria temporarily yesterday in an attempt to control the numbers entering the country. Police said more than 16,000 people arrived in Munich between Saturday morning and Sunday afternoon. Jane Francis Kelly reports some viewers may find some of the images distressing. A state of emergency has been declared in California after wildfires forced thousands of people to flee their homes. Four firefighters were hurt tackling one blaze. Dozens of properties are reported to have been destroyed. Here's our Los Angeles correspondent, James Cook. A volcano on the southern Japanese island of Kyushu has erupted, sending huge plumes of smoke 2,000 metres into the air. Those are the main stories this morning. Time now is 11 minutes past six. Mike's here with sport. Yeah, good morning. And the most partisan crowd that Novak Djokovic has ever faced. Wow. At one point, they were so pro-Federer, the crowd in New York, they were actually booing Djokovic. But, of course, the super cool Serb, he's never faced by that, is he? And he marches on and on. Steph, our own Steph, wasn't far behind. Well, it was it two hours and seven two hours minutes? Seven. Either, good on brilliant that. to run yeah, 30 miles good. in that time. And well done to all those yeah. who ran yesterday. And that life will never be the same again. So, Michael Owen, really, really feeling that this morning. OK, Mike, we'll leave it there. Thank you. We'll see you later on. Uh, let's quick look at the uh, front page of the newspapers at the Times, their main story. And lots of them carrying the same picture, actually, of Jeremy Corbyn, um, who was announced about yesterday at a constituency event in North London. Uh, that's the way that the Times have written it up. Labour divisions widen as Corbyn takes charge. Uh, they say the new leader faces challenges from within over Europe and defence. Yes, yeah, so you get a sense of where some of the newspapers coming from this morning, the coverage. Uh... Uh, front page of The Independent, they're trying to keep track of the uh, front benches to quit. They've counted now um, 11 front benches. Um, they say to quit launching attack on a leader's Euroscepticism. Yes, yeah, so we will be talking to uh, two Labour MPs this morning about uh, what the feeling is amongst the party. Another of the stories that's making lots of the newspapers this morning um, is about Germany. Um, Germany last night reimposed controls on its border with Austria as the country uh, is trying to cope with the pressure from a record influx of migrants. Yes, indeed, those two stories both on the front page of The Guardian this morning, the uh, news of the German... 16 minutes past six. Uh, this is Breakfast from BBC News, our main stories this morning. Good morning, both. Very well, thank you, Charlie. Come back to me and a new friend. What's your name? Hello? My name is Linda. I am a research robot from the University of Lincoln. It's lovely to meet you, Linda. I'll be talking to you later. She's going to have a good look at me now. Uh, once it was all just science fiction, wasn't it? Now intelligent machines are doing more and more jobs that used to be done by humans. This week, the BBC is looking at how artificial intelligence is rapidly changing the world we, as we know it. So, slightly off-putting with her looking at me, actually, but uh, does AI just make our lives easier or could it threaten your job? Breakfast John McGuire reports. Lots of interesting things to think about. Would you yes. describe or a colleague? Um, actually turned into a friend. A colleague turned really? into a friend, kind of, yeah. You see, that's immediately interesting, isn't it? Because you, you've made her look sort of quite human in some ways, haven't you? Was that a, a, a conscious choice? ...and that people are, are not too scared of, because we take these robots out into care homes and onto, like... Um, I think she's going to go and meet Charlie, actually, but what does, she, what does she, and I'm going to call her she, what does she see? Well, she sees the world through a number of different sensors here. Yeah. So she's got sensors right here on the top, where um, we get kind of a... Um, kind of games console type of thing. A specific sensor mm -hmm. called a laser sensor measures distances, and that's how the robot is able to build maps of the world. Right, that she'll be able to do. And what's she being used for at the moment? Well, we actually use her uh, in two different scenarios. There's that we use her in care, and we also use her in security. Um, mm. The security domain is probably the more kind of um, obvious one because this robot, as it has all these sensors, it can if someone puts a bag somewhere where you don't expect it, or if there's people in areas where you usually wouldn't expect them. So 
Think of it a bit as a security guard, if you want. Um, and I mean, so, so she sees something that would alert a human, would she, to that problem? Yes, or indeed. What would happen? So this robot is complementing, let's say, other humans. Right? The idea is that this is a useful tool. It can run 24-7. Well, needs some can charging. Can you identify yourself, please? Oh, yeah. I'm Louise. Don't you already know who I am, Linda? Um, her voice is interesting, actually, because it's quite a calm voice. Is that a purposeful thing that you've chosen? To be very honest, this is uh, like off-the-shelf software that you can basically everybody could use, taken from the internet. We built a lot of components of uh, built these robots of a lot of components that you can um, take and that the community shares. And uh, Charlie, you, I'm not sure you've been able to look so closely, but she's got a very lovely set of eyelashes as well. No, she rounded uh, by a step. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't get up on the platform, so wasn't allowed up here on the side. Yes, you, you were well, safe we're still up there. safe, yes, then. We're not going to lose our jobs. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. Thank you. Linda's still talking. Hello, welcome back. This is Breakfast with Charlie State and Louise Minchin. Just coming up to 6.30 this morning. All the latest news and sport coming up a little later on. A summary now of this morning's main news. And the new Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has tried to reach out to all parts of his party as he announced who is to fill key posts in his shadow cabinet. One of his rivals for the leadership, Andy Burnham, is shadow Home Secretary, while his close ally, John MacDonald, becomes shadow Chancellor. Thank you. Well, uh, Jeremy Corbyn's victory will also be a major talking point at the annual TUC conference in Brighton today. European Union ministers will gather in Brussels today for an emergency meeting on the migration crisis. Security forces in Egypt have killed 12 people, including two Mexican tourists, by mistake. Talks will begin later this morning at Stormont to resolve the crisis threatening the future of power sharing in Northern Ireland. A state of emergency has been declared in California after wildfires forced thousands of people to flee their homes. Four firefighters were hurt tackling one blaze and hundreds of properties are reported to have been destroyed. Here's our Los Angeles correspondent, James Cook. A volcano on the southern Japanese island of Kayashu has erupted, sending huge plumes of smoke 2,000 metres into the air. Um, Carol is going to have all the weather for us this morning and more from our I think, resident robots. Would that be a fair way of yeah, describing them? Yeah, they're in the them? house. They're definitely in the house. They may be taking over the house. Feeling a bit fresh, Djokovic's dog. There safe. you go. Do you? Do you know? What's the dog called? <laughs> no, I don't expect you to know you don't do the sport. What's it called? Pierre. Yeah. Oh, Actually, I think he's got yeah. two dogs. I don't know the other one, anyway. Anyway, he's celebrating with Pierre, extra biscuits, another Grand Slam title. So Bradley Smith is now up to fifth in the standings. Very good, Mike. Have you had a chance to meet any of our robot friends this morning? A bit threatened, I must admit. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll see more of them in just a moment, Mike. Thank you. Six at 42. This is Breakfast from BBC News, our main stories this morning. Joined by a couple of guest presenters this morning as part of the BBC's look at robots and artificial intelligence this week. Let's see what they can do. Over to you. OK, Carol, thank you very much. Did you enjoy iCarb? She's quite cute, I think. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll hope she's not going to be too good. Thank you very much, Carol. Carol doesn't say that about me. <laughs> uh, let's see, 6.45 is the time now. The, ho the housing shortage in this country is well known, yet more than 600,000 of them in England remain empty. New analysis out today shows vacant properties are concentrated in the north in areas which have lower than average house prices at higher levels of deprivation. Breakfast Jamie Govan is in Manchester for us this morning, a street with more than its fair share of empty houses. Jane, you're going to show us round, I think. Jane, thank you very much. It's very interesting. We'll be back with more with Jane a little later in the programme. We will indeed. Uh, sweeping reforms that would make it harder for workers to take strike action are going to be discussed by MPs later today. Yes, the debate comes just as the TUC gathers for its annual conference in Brighton. And Ben is there for us this morning. Morning to you, Ben. Oh, ben, thank you very much. Yes, we'll see you a little bit later. Thank you. Time now to get the news, travel and weather where you are. See you in a couple of minutes. This is Breakfast with Charlie State and Louise Minchin. Labour's new leader, Jeremy Corbyn, names his shadow cabinet. Good morning. It's Monday the 14th of September. Also this morning. And a special series we'll be asking, could a robot take... Hmm, I'm not sure. That was iCub, though. More with iCub a little later on. <laughs> yes, and Carol has the weather morning.
Good morning. First, our main story. The new Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has tried to reach out to all parts of his party as he announced who's to fill key posts in his shadow cabinet. One of his rivals for the leadership, Andy Burnham, is shadow Home Secretary, while his close ally, John McDonnell, becomes shadow Chancellor. Our political correspondent, Eleanor Garnier, has more. A moment, thank you. Well, Jeremy Corbyn's victory will also be a major talking point at the annual TUC conference in Brighton today. Also on the agenda is how to respond to government plans to press ahead with its reform of trade unions, which would make strike action more difficult. With that, Ben is in Brighton for us. Man, let's talk about those proposed changes. Morning. And thank you very much. European Union ministers will gather in Brussels today for an emergency meeting on the migration crisis. Germany closed its border with Austria temporarily yesterday in an attempt to control the numbers entering the country. The uh, situation as it stands there this morning. Thank you. Security forces in Egypt have killed 12 people, including two Mexican tourists, by mistake. A state of emergency has been declared in California after wildfires forced thousands of people to flee their homes. Four firefighters were hurt tackling one blaze and hundreds of properties are reported to have been destroyed. Here's our Los Angeles correspondent, James Cook. A volcano on the southern Japanese island of Kushu has uh, erupted, sending huge plumes of smoke 2,000 metres into the air. It is uh, 11 minutes past seven and you are watching BBC Breakfast. Should we take you back to our main story? And as Labour's new leader, Jeremy Corbyn, assembles assembles his top team, his allies say he's managed to reflect the full range of opinion and talent in the party ranks. They say they've attracted 15,000 new members in the last 24 hours, but there's dissent from within the party about some of the shadow cabinet appointments. Well, we're joined now by Labour MP John Mann. Morning to you. Thanks very Good much morning. for joining us. Um, have you had a word with Jeremy Corbyn as yet? Uh, not yet, but I send him my congratulations, as we would to anyone else who's won an election. What do you think about the future of the party? Is he going to be able to unite it? Well, he's going to be given the chance to do so. He's got a backbench MP. You can say things and talk about things in a way that you can't when you're a leader, or you can, but it comes under scrutiny of a very different kind. So already, immediately, as a shadow cabinet is announced, people are looking at that and casting judgment. For example, there are people already saying that of those senior appointments, there are no women. And already that's been seen as a potential problem. Can I, can I just check then? I mean, you said this is, this is a problem. You've seen what he's, the, the people he's appointed so far. I mean, has he got it right so far? And so would the party, if that were to happen. Well, I mean, his, his supporters are going to come back to Labour. If they do brilliant, I think there's a danger that they may be getting a little carried away with themselves. And they've got to think through what does the country want and listen, and not just listen to themselves, and the euphoria of winning, but listen to those people who didn't vote. For example, the trade unionists. He won most of them. Only 71,000 voted. But when Tony Blair won in 94, three quarters of a million voted. John, with your knowledge of uh, Labour MPs, and you have the advantage over us because you obviously chat, the impression given by some political commentators is that a lot of you feel like you, you have to say zipped for now because the party has spoken, but many of you and your colleagues have your own opinions, which, frankly, you're not going to tell us. So whether that's reflected how many are like you who are able to speak their minds and how many others think something that they're just not going to say in public. I suppose I want to, what I want to ask you as well is you, you're very, you've been very... Um, that's what you want. You want to be judged on what happens within the electorate. That's how you would see it. It would well, be well, the fair way to do well, it. Well, it's not being cagey. I gave him my views, didn't always like it. What I wanted how, how was him Jeremy... to win, and it's the same with, it's the same with Jeremy Corbyn. You know, Jeremy Corbyn has to lead us to victory, otherwise he's no use to us. Look at that, and, and that, that's what you, the, the test is there. Payment by results. Mm. Very much. Let's see, it's now 17 minutes past seven. Uh, we're speaking to the former Shadow Attorney General, Emily Thornbury, just after eight o'clock. She's been tipped for a job in Corbyn's new team. We'll ask her questions a little later on. Um, shall we catch up with Carol with the weather? Very good morning again, Carol. Good morning, both. Good morning. See you later. Uh, once it was all just science fiction, wasn't it? Now, intelligent machines are doing more and more jobs that used to be done by humans. This week, the BBC is looking at how artificial intelligence is rapidly changing the world as we know it. So, does AI just make our lives easier or could it threaten jobs? Breakfast John Maguire reports. Having the, the robot kind of looking at you while you're, while you're yes. talking. But I've got one more question for iCub. Who is your favourite breakfast presenter? She's because she speaks Spanish and she likes to travel. 
I can. There you go, Lou. Oh, nice, thank you it? very much, Icom. It's thank lovely to meet much. you, by the way, Icom. Thank you. <laughs> He asked everybody that. Um, uh, you can find out how likely it is that a robot will take your job. There's an interactive page on the BBC website right now at the bbc.co.uk forward slash intelligent and machines. And we'll be talking about it very a little bit later as well. Thank you so much Jeff, for, your, for getting in touch too. Lots of you are giving your point of view on what you think of our robots here this morning. Coming up on Breakfast, uh, we're looking at a new plan to turn empty homes into affordable ones that people want to live in. Breakfast, Jane McCubbin is in one. Hello, welcome back. This is Breakfast with Charlie State and Louise Minchin. Time now is 7.31. The main stories this morning. The new Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has tried to reach out to all parts of his party as he announced who's to fill key posts in his shadow cabinet. Yes, and we'll be speaking to the former shadow attorney general, Emily Thornbury, just, just after 8 o'clock, who has been tipped for a job in Corbyn's new team, but the full announcement has yet to be made. Jeremy Corbyn's victory will also be a major talking point at the annual TUC conference in Brighton today. European Union ministers will gather in Brussels today for an emergency meeting on the migration crisis. Germany closed its border with Austria. Security forces in Egypt have killed 12 people, including two Mexican tourists by mistake. A state of emergency has been declared in California after wildfires forced thousands of people to flee their homes. Coming up a little bit later on the programme, Carol will have all the weather for us. Right now, Mike's here. Yeah, and the most partisan crowd that Novak Djokovic has probably ever faced. They were so strongly behind Roger Federer at Flushing Meadows in New York, even booing Djokovic at one point. But he's so cool, isn't he? He certainly doesn't let that sort of thing phase him. And tries to win over the crowd with just incredible continued success. Still only 28 as well. Yeah, quite a few jumps. <laughs> Comfort. Uh, nice I can completely Pierre understand Wang. that. Sorry? I can completely yeah, understand. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. But Pierre doesn't do interviews, obviously. They obviously, I said something, did something, or, or like must have you. smelt funny. I, mean, I don't know. You just, you didn't just have that knack. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank uh, see you, you later on. And of course, coming up in a few minutes' time, we'll have all the weather with Carol. We will indeed. And now, over the last few months, the Greek island of Lesbos has seen thousands of migrants and refugees arrive on its shores. Extra staff and ships have been brought in to help, but the island's been buckling under the pressure. It's a picture that's repeated in many places around Europe, making life difficult both for migrants and those communities trying to host them. So what is the long-term, short-term solution as well? Let's speak now to David. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, so just give us a sense of what you've seen there and what kind of impact it's having on the island of Lesbos. What can be done to help them there in order to, be, to help those refugees who can see behind you quite clearly? Can that be changed? You talk about diplomatic solutions, but what would make the difference? UK, uh, with regard to refugees and the amount of refugees it is now committed to, what would you like to see the UK doing? Well, what, what, what kind of role would you like to see the UK have? I must ask you, given your well-known, obviously, um, connections, etc., uh, with the Labour Party, do you think that Jeremy Corbyn, as new leader, is the man that can unite the party? It's going to have to wait. So are you saying that one day you might go back to that? And uh, thank you very much for joining us live here on Breakfast this morning. Thank you. Let's see the time now. It's 7.43. You're watching Breakfast from BBC News. A reminder of our main stories this morning. Yes, we have an unusual day in the studio this morning. We've got various... Uh... Lots more presenters, really. Yeah, I was going to say people, not people. Mm. Robots. Yes. Artificial intelligence is what we're talking about. We are. And we're going to see if they can, I don't know, do a bit of our job. Who are we going to talk to now? Is this Linda. Linda, over to you. Leave you, Carol. <laughs> so you can sneeze her. Like, leave her so you can sneeze in peace. Oh, <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> oh, I thought we were still on it. That no, doesn't happen very often. <laughs> it was a sneeze, a live television sneeze. Normally what happens, Carol, you're right now. Yes, yes you've recovered you. now. Normally what happens yeah. is the adrenaline kicks in, doesn't it, and they just go away again. Oh, but, I've uh, sneezed live on telly. Yeah. Silly. There we go. Let's see, time now, 7.47. Sweeping reforms that would make it harder for workers to take strike action will be discussed by MPs later today. Yes, that debate comes just as the TUC gathers for its annual conference in Brighton. They'll be discussing that as well. Ben is there for us. Morning. Thank you. See you later. Thanks. 7.53. The housing shortage in this country is well known. So why do more than 600,000 homes in England remain empty? New analysis out today shows vacant properties are concentrated in the north in areas which have lower than average house prices and higher levels of deprivation. Breakfast Jane McGovern is in Manchester for us this morning. Illustration of exactly the problem we're talking about. Jane, thank you. Yep, thank you very much. And as I said, uh, they need more traders there. Time now, um, news, travel and the weather wherever you are. We'll have the headlines at eight. See you then.
Hello, good morning. This is Breakfast with Charlie State and Louise Minchin. Labour's new leader, Jeremy Corbyn, names his shadow cabinet. It's Monday the 14th of September. Also this morning, and in a special series, we'll be asking, could a robot take your job? That's Linda. That's Linda. Mm. Doing our job, kind of. <laughs> Carol's got the weather for us. Morning. First, our main story. The new Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has tried to reach out to all parts of his party as he announced who is to fill key posts in his shadow cabinet. One of his rivals for the leadership, Andy Burnham, is shadow Home Secretary, while his close ally, John McDonnell, becomes shadow Chancellor. Our political correspondent, El Nagana, has more. For the moment, thank you. Well, Jeremy Corbyn's victory will also be a major talking point at the annual TUC conference in Brighton today. Security forces in Egypt have killed 12 people, including two Mexican tourists, by mistake. A state of emergency has been declared in California after wildfires forced thousands of people to flee their homes. Four firefighters were hurt tackling one blaze and hundreds of properties are reported to have been destroyed. Here's our Los Angeles correspondent, James Cook. In the meantime, David Cameron is visiting Beirut to see the refugee camps Britain is helping to pay for. Lebanon is hosting over a million refugees fleeing the civil war in neighbouring Syria. The Prime Minister announced that he is appointing a minister to be responsible for Syrian refugees, the MP Richard Harrington. So the Prime Minister are visiting refugee camps. Let's get more from our Middle East correspondent Jim Muir, who's in Beirut. And Jim, just tell us a little bit about the visit and why it's important. Muir in Beirut. Thank you, Jim. Let's see, the time now is 10 minutes past eight. Let's go back to our lead story now. As Labour's new leader, Jeremy Corbyn, assembles his top team, his allies say he's managed to reflect full range of opinion and talent in the party ranks. They say they've attracted 15,000 new members in the last 24 hours, but there is dissent from within the party about some of the shadow cabinet appointments. Let's talk about this now. Joined by a former shadow attorney general. Get a call later on, maybe you'll let us know. OK, we'll see. Thank you. <laughs> All right. 16 minutes past eight. Uh, this is breakfast. Our main story's here this morning. Carol has the weather for us again. Covered from her sneezes. Hopefully morning. Now, once it was all just science fiction, now intelligent machines are doing more and more jobs that used to be done by humans. This week, the BBC is looking at how artificial intelligence is rapidly changing the world as we know it. So does AI make our lives easier or could it actually threaten some of our jobs? We're going to talk about it with two robots uh, who've been in the studio with us all morning. And who is this with you? Good morning. Who are you? Right, yes, so she's she is. A, very good morning to you. As a research robot, what kind of things does she do? Robots out to security domains, so security applications and care applications. But yes. it can provide that extra like, pair of eyes to make sure everybody is safe and... And, and you've used place. it in real life situations already, haven't you? For example, in Austria, what, helping people with pacemakers, is that right? They're suffering from dementia mm. and they kind of lose the focus. They don't know what they're doing. And then we the idea to take the robot and actually guide them through the, the tour. And this worked really well, so the people engaged very well with the robot. It's not really replacing the therapist, but it was actually helping them to have, provide a focal point, let's say, for the, for the patients. Um, I know Linda's going to go on a little bit of a walk because we're going to be able to see what she can see, actually. It's on the top and there's yeah. a laser scanner down there, which helps her to map the environment, to move about safely. So you're talking to them. Oh, right. She said the time was looking Sorry good this that. morning. Yeah. Right. So that, that's, and we also mm -hmm. use all these sensors then to um, understand the world, to see whether, where there's people, where they're moving about, and not only to move more reliably in space, but also to then understand if something is happening. So if you see like a group of people wandering in the middle of the night, that's something suspicious that you might want to flag up. OK, so she might be used in security situations yes, exactly. and to identify people. I, know, I didn't move purposefully when she came over here. Yeah. Does she have some sort of set spatial... So, you know, where, where, how close she goes to people. Yes, yes. So there's actually some research going on on how you move appropriately around people. And mm. uh, actually, there's, there's quite some differences between cultures. So maybe the, the kind of the British way is probably you kind of keep a little <laughs> bit of a more of a distance here. Um, yeah, uh, but the, the general idea is, yeah, you want to stay away from people, especially when they're vulnerable people, yes. and um, you want to make safely, safe movements around space. That's an interesting for very interesting to meet you and her. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda. Thank and we're also, you. Thank you. And we're also, I love the lashes that she's got. And we're also going to talk about iCub, who I think some of you will have seen earlier. How are these? I mean, obviously, they look different, these two robots. How is what you're doing different as well? Morning. So iCub is a research robot that's being developed by uh, European partners across all of Europe. And it's a humanoid. So it has human-like body, human-like sensors. Mm. Uh, we're really using it as a research platform to understand 
how human cognition, how our minds operate by trying to program a robot to think like us. Right, OK. And you've got two colleagues as well behind you. Yep. What, how are they involved? Because I understand that ICAB will be able, can respond to me. Yes, so ICAB can do some behaviour autonomously, but some other aspects of his behaviour involve uh, remote control. Okay. And in a live TV situation, we tend to do more remote control than we might do in the lab. But I'm going to ask um, ICUB some questions. So will they be making up the answers or will ICUB actually be responding to so them? So the uh, answers are, are pre-programmed. Right. But uh, ICUB can do speech recognition. OK, so, so I'm going to test ICUB. Okay. Are you ready, ICUB? Um, I, I want to ask you, first of all, do you support a football team? Yes. Many of my robot friends play football. So many of your friends play football. OK, so which team do you support then? I'm going to ask. I support Arsenal because they play like robots. <laughs> I don't know if any Arsenal fans heard that properly. What they, you support Arsenal because they play like robots. Um, so the, he is listening to me and understands the question. Is that, is that really, that's what's going on? No, he doesn't understand. So okay. he's able to convert spoken words into text. Yes. And then he's able to match text with some written sentences and generate a sentence that we've paired with it. Mm. Now, some AI programs are able to interpret text and give you a deeper answer and maybe consult the web. But yes. uh, with ICUB, we're focusing on other things like his ability to attend to faces, his ability to remember things that have happened, his ability to recognise actions that people do. So forward wind to the future, what do you imagine ICUB being able to do? So... One of the big tasks in robotics is to integrate all the different aspects of AI. Mm. So language understanding is one, perception, understanding the visual world is another. Right now it's very difficult for robots even to recognise people. So Linda can do it, iCub can do it to some extent, but recognising how people are moving and what their attentions are, which we do very automatically, is hard for robots. OK, and just one final question. Charlie asks this as well. Who is your favourite breakfast presenter? Charlie, because he is my new friend, but I still like Louise. <laughs> I'm not sure that's quite good enough. I'm, uh, I will accept it on this occasion, though. Charlie, you are now the favourite. Yeah, iCub is fickle. Yeah. <laughs> Every hour she changes he, she changes her mind. I think Linda, actually, our, f our friend robot, um, has quite a calming voice. Really? Yes, I do. I don't think. I, actually, I do find them genuinely quite irritating. <laughs> anyway, coming up from the moment, the BBC News Channel has a business live. Here on breakfast, the country faces a shortage of homes, yet many remain empty, and most of these are in deprived areas. Hello, welcome back. This is Breakfast with Charlie State and Louise Minchin. Time now is 8.31. Our main stories this morning. The new Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, has tried to reach out to all parts of his party as he announced who's to fill key posts in his shadow cabinet. Jeremy Corbyn's victory will also be a major talking point at the annual TUC conference in Brighton today. David Cameron is uh, visiting Beirut to see the refugee camps Britain is helping to pay for. Lebanon is hosting over a million refugees fleeing the civil war in neighbouring Syria. The Prime Minister also announced that he is appointing a minister to be responsible for Syrian refugees, the MP Richard Harrington. European Union ministers will gather in Brussels today for an emergency meeting on the migration crisis. Security forces in Egypt have killed 12 people, including two Mex Mexican tourists, by mistake. See more of those photographs a bit later. Morning, Mike. Good morning. In 1997, mm -hmm. China, the reigning champions. In Zurich, they've developed quadrocopters. It's very good. Is That's it? Finally good. Does yeah. it have an annoying voice like Charlie thinks most of them, most of them do? But I about Novak Djokovic, or indeed the two Brits who have won. Jordan Wiley in the singles uh, title in the wheelchair uh, tennis, the first time she's won a singles title, and Gordon Reed as well, so well done to those two. Right. Well, a few thousand more. I wouldn't make an accountant, would I? But well done. <laughs> Amazing bit of history for Scott. Very good, Mike. Thank you. Good to see you, Mike. Thank you. Thriller writer Frederick Forsyth's latest book features a maverick hero who speaks three languages, spies for his country and enjoys the company of at least one glamorous secret agent. Yes, but unlike his other stories, this is no work of fiction. It's his own autobiography and Freddie is here to tell us a little more. Very good morning, morning to you. Morning to you. Uh, a lot of people, the first thing they ask about autobiographies is, is, is why now? 
Because you've mm. been reluctant. I get the impression you've been reluctant to, to tell your story up well, until now. It sounds like when we read it like that, and of course that's how we've chosen to write it, um, like something a little bit out of James Bond. And that's so, in some ways your life has been a bit like that. Mm, well. <laughs> First sat um, in a plane, which was sort of a life changing. I was five and I was picked up physically and plopped into a Spitfire cockpit. Your story, people will be familiar with it. Other parts, they won't. And certainly the, the passages you wrote about your correspondent, you, you're being a war correspondent in, uh, in Nigeria, particularly. Oh. This is 1960, yeah, around 68. 67 to 70. Yes. And there are passages of, of this, of your life, that are very much sort of adventure, like a boy's own adventure. Other parts are very, very distressing. And you witnessed some, some terrible things during that conflict, particularly. Yeah. Um, there was a moment when you were, you were typing out your story in a, in a, in a hut in the middle of nowhere. Mm. You saw something, I think. That and there's also um, a sort of theme running through the book of luck, isn't there? And and how yeah. things have, you know, you've had some lucky things happen to you and, and how you came to write in the first place. Cool. Yeah, it was the day of the jackal, yeah. It's, it's extraordinary. You wrote it in, in record time. One, uh, the, other, the other theme that comes across, uh, and this tickles me enormously, is this notion throughout your career, you've played the bumbling fool, either yeah. in or out of situations. The, the, you, the sort of Wood, uh, P.G. Woodhouse a, type a character. Cover story. Uh, it's a nice fascinating read, and it is an extraordinary life <laughs> you've led. Uh, Any other books coming out? I mean, no, that's the last one. Uh, it is. I, I, I know I've said it before, um, but that's the last. I'm not writing anymore. At all? At all. I have no more novels. And this isn't a, a novel. I mean, I, I thought it, thought with my last book, which is The Kill List, I thought that's the last. And then people said, oh, go on, you know, all those stories you tell over dinner, um, put them down, put them down. So I did eventually, and there it is. Well, there you go. Frederick Forsyth's book is called The Outsider. Thank you so much. Now, as part of the BBC's series on artificial intelligence, we have had two rather special guests this morning. Uh, Freddie, you might have seen them as you came past mm. this morning. It's Linda and iCub. Uh, We're robots. Your replacement, I think. Yes, I think they are. <laughs> I'm glad you pointed at him, not yeah. me. Both uh, of our replacements, <laughs> I think. Uh, iCub is a fan of Carol and is very keen to get involved with our weather report. Carol, we always stay tuned to you. Thank you very much. See you a little bit later. Let's see time now, 8.49. The housing shortage in this country is well known. So why do more than 600,000 empty homes in England remain empty? A new analysis out today shows vacant properties are concentrated in the north in areas which have lower than average house prices and higher levels of deprivation. Breakfast Jane McCubbin is in Manchester for us this morning in a street with more than its fair share of empty houses and also some people who are hopefully going to try and help with that. Morning. Absolutely. I know Nick a little bit. I expect there will also be endless cups of tea supplied. <laughs> endless cups of tea. Yes. Well, All right. Yeah, builder's tea. Proper builder's tea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll go uh, back. We'd like to happens. do that. Thank you both. Now, being a good wildlife photographer requires patience, perseverance, but the results can often be spectacular. Thousands of incredible images were entered in the British Wildlife Photography Awards. We'll take a look at some of them in a moment. Thank you, gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, what an amazing... Well, congratulations oh, to both you of you, you, first of all. And I think we might as well see the pictures straight yeah. away. So, Kyle, uh, do us the honours. Let's have a look at your image now. I want to know a little bit, because so many of us now take photos on our phones, don't we? Um, you use... that's what you... do you use your phone as well, or do you use... Camera? Yeah, I you... use my iPhone all the time. Taking, it's got great cameras and... Go back to the picture for a minute. You, did, you, did you say you put, you put the flash behind where the frog was? Yeah. But how did you know the frog was going to stay no, after yeah, three hours really, of waiting? Not very good signal out there, so... <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations to and both of you. And good luck. Yes, the actor Gugu and Bartha Raw will be with us in just a few minutes' time, talking about uh, her new play, which is coming on to the Globe Theatre shortly. Also, she's got two new films out too. First, though, a last brief look at the headlines wherever you are this morning. See you in a couple of minutes. Hello, welcome back. It's been six years since Gugu and Bartha Raw was last seen treading the boards when she starred opposite Jude Law. In Hamlet. Yes, after a successful stint on the silver screen, she's now making a return to the theatre, playing a 17th century actress considered one of the first stars of the stage. Very good morning to you. Uh, back at one of your best known ro movie roles, this time in the 2013 film Belle. It's quite emotional watching that. Yeah. <laughs> Are you caught up in the moment again? <laughs> 
Oh, that was. So tell us a little bit about the play and about Nell herself, because she was an extraordinary person in many ways, wasn't yes. she? Yes. And the play's not the Globe. Yes. Have you performed there before? I think, but I mean, quite challenging, mm. I would imagine, because it must be quite different from working in a conventional theatre situation. And Nell Gwynn started, I, um, what, serving oranges or something? Is that how she... Is in the theatre people use for... Is it the triple threat? Triple threat. threat. <laughs> That's what you're called, isn't it? A couple of movies out, haven't you? Um, the one that we'll, we'll love in our household, without doubt, is Beauty and the Beast. That's got to be quite... Oh! Fun. A little bit about the, the film? What, what? Yes, um, it's... it's The it's, it's... of a Feather Duster is... Is, is... It's about concussion as well. Yes, concussion. Uh... Uh, we often ask people when they, when they work with a big star like that. I mean, first day on set, I mean, do, 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 you, what's that like? <laughs> Um, is, is there a bit of a gulp? Uh, here yeah, I am. Yeah. Some different things going on here, haven't you? What's? <laughs> I don't have know. You, I've never met, met one they, before. Well, Where are I? Can introduce you. <laughs> Linda over here. Can you Hi, see Linda? Linda. Uh, Linda's, Linda's got great <laughs> eyelashes. <laughs> Can we get Linda yeah. over? Here she comes. Yes. Oh my goodness. I think she's got a very reassuring voice, but Charlie doesn't agree with me. Well, I just sometimes I find no disrespect, Linda. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I find their voices a little bit irritating. Yeah, sometimes. they are a little bit sort of well robotic, I guess. Yes. <laughs> Fancy. It's very put off putting. It's on at London's Globe Theatre. Soon. Thank you. It's yes. so lovely to meet you. Thank I'm slightly you. intimidated by having Linda standing behind me. Yes, she's been hanging around in the studio all morning. She was invited, all part of the BBC News Week on Artificial Intelligence. Uh, Linda, thank you very much. Does this mean I have got the job? Yes, OK, Linda. I'm not sure I can... Back no. in your box, I think, <laughs> is, the, is the phrase that comes to mind. Come on, over there. <laughs> Sam. We just turn her off, Charlie. She's not There she's going, it. now. Just follow the order. Bye. <laughs>